in order to watch The Matrix, I have to watch it tonight when it comes out. You're not buying that. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So The Matrix Resurrections has a no cinema score yet. It has a 6.7 average critic rating on IMDb, a, um, a 65 Metasco Metacritic Metascore. Rotten Tomatoes, 70% are giving it above like a, a positive review, but that average positive review is a 6.4. So generally in the 60s out of 100 for other people's ratings of this movie. The synopsis on Rotten Tomatoes, if it lacks the original's bracingly original craft, the original's original. The Matrix Resurrections revisits the world of the franchise with wit, a timely perspective, and heart. A timely perspective is what I'm looking for. So a little while ago, uh, someone talked to, I think it was uh, Lana Wachowski talked to the press about Keanu Reeves' first reaction to watching this movie, saying that in 1999, they made a movie that predicted the next 20 years of blockbuster movie making and somehow they did it again. And it's like, okay, that's that's nice of him. And, um, oh look, setting alarms. It's late. Um, then the ad campaign for this movie really grabbed me by the throat. The uh, teases to get to see little bits of extra footage the idea of putting out a trailer that made this look like something like The Force Awakens, just a soft reboot of the original, but then deliberately playing up to this idea. The Matrix was wholly original, except for the little pieces that were assumed to not be. I mean, there. imagine Morpheus when he's standing in the room with Neo and he talks about the loading dock, uh, clothing, weapons, anything you can imagine. There's this idea of a bendable, foldable world that is potentially limitless. The ideas and the originality and the aesthetic change the way action movies were made, change so much about the world. I don't think anyone's gonna expect the same level of originality. And yet there was this tease that we've been making movies that are just the same movie, just making more of the same franchises. I mean, like, I, I'm not down on the things that we like. We like them because we like them. So I'm not gonna say that there's anything wrong with continuing to be inspired by the same things and, you know, just work for people. There's this little spark that The Matrix Resurrections was going to be something that reflects on that paradigm the Force Awakens paradigm of looking back and and trying to re-spark audience investment in the same story, in the same characters, in the same world. Lena Wachowski has gone on record saying that there is an enjoyable movie at the surface of this movie and there are seeds for people to enjoy beneath the surface of this movie. And if there is a subtext created story or plot in this movie, I'm going to be looking for it avidly. I really like things like this and never feel smart enough to follow through on them. Like to actually come up with my own analytic or theory. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot uh, whenever I see this movie to see what the story beneath the surface of whatever this story is is trying to tell me. For the most part, I'm going in just with what I've seen in the trailers, and the trailers were a lot of images from the others showing that this movie was going to somehow parallel or reflect that and have something to say about its connection to the original movies. So I'm looking for something original told through the guise of being something unoriginal. Why use old code to do something new? That's what came from the trailer. And I'm hoping that there's a story, whether it's at face value or not, that answers that question. So. So, I, I'm glad I took a couple of days to think about this one. 
let me go ahead and give a quick review for people. Uh, I Hopefully you can watch this. You can watch a little bit of the intro, a little bit of the review, and then if I ramble on for extra, people can leave and they can leave happy with what they saw. Like, The Matrix Resurrections is competent. It is Lane Wachowski and Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss and everyone showing with the addition of Jessica Henwick and Jonathan Groff and a new crew of, uh, well, Yahya Abdul-Mateen's to um that there's a fan base and a legacy behind this movie and it tries to play in the world of that movie there are martial arts there are characters plugged into machines there are characters fighting machines there it's it's what you expect from continuing the matrix at its surface, this is sort of a reboot of Neo trapped in the Matrix wakes up, throw a twist in there having to do with Trinity, and they learn to bend the rules, break out, and fight agents that are trying to keep human beings suppressed. And on that level, it's fine and enjoyable. And on that level, I can understand why there are a lot of positive feedback because where some of the sequels laid into a lot of drier discussions and exposition regarding philosophy and the reasons why things are happening. Honestly, this is the first time that I felt like Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss had real human chemistry. Them engaging as humans, not entirely sure what's going on, felt more real than it did in across three movies of them saying, because you are the one, I am fated to be in love with you. It's not fate, it's a choice. Generally, action serves its purpose and it's an achievement of a team of people pulling off crazy stunt work, great. Um, direction, I'm a little iffy on just because you have things like this in The Matrix Reloaded, And if you take this example of the that character, the Merovingian, sending old programs out of spite at Neo to fight people, you have in contrast this, which pulls all of the tricks people have been using, uh, shaky cam and uh, lighting, lighting to mask stunt doubles, and like a lot of the tropes of action movies that people have been calling out for years. And, and here's the, the first real problem. Keanu Reeves is the star of a trilogy of movies that are fundamentally an action crew was tired of working on movies that didn't direct action in a way that felt satisfying. And... So they were like, we're going to pull the camera back. We're going to show clearly what's happening. We're going to pay attention to the choreography and let it breathe. And we're not going to do quick cuts and jumpy edits and hide things and shake the camera and do all of these things that the Matrix does. And it's confusing because I don't know if maybe that's the Lily Wachowski element that's missing. Is this this graphic novel or comic book or uh, anime inspired style of the Matrix is sort of gone in favor of a more traditional action movie, video game based experience. And it's okay for it to be different because then again, we're talking about a system that's different because of the results of the first three, but there's a little bit of a problem if the fundamental point of your movie is talking about breaking beyond the bounds of what's traditionally possible. And yet what you're showing is your main characters engaging in what's traditionally possible, even like, not as great as some things. It's sort of a mixed message visually and mentally. I don't know. Why wake Neo up? The idea is they don't bring up, the humans don't bring up that they need Neo to help win a war. They just feel like, oh, he's imprisoned and so we have to break him out. Um, but the, I mean, like at base value, people know that the reason there was any peace between humans and machines is because Neo sacrificed himself. So if they brought him back, why did the machines bring him back? And why are the humans bringing him back? These are two central questions which they don't answer. But in the first Matrix movie, there was a tease for the sequels before they knew sequels were going to happen. And in this one, the analyst does reference 
people he's working for. And it's possible that this is supposed to be another tease for movies that could happen. But honestly, I can't go any further before I break down what inherently the Matrix story is. As just entertainment and as something philosophical to chew on, fine to great, with a little bit of a knock on the action direction. Um, Character-wise, like Jessica Henwick brought a lot of uh, sincerity to her character. Um, I was excited about the prospect of guessing what was happening all the way through, and I still feel like it's a little bit flexible in that. Like, I don't 100% understand the opening. Like, do the machines put on a show? I don't know. This is I'll get into this in a minute. So, The Matrix, 1999, is about people versus... Machines. The humans blow up the energy source of the machines. So the machines still win. They take over people. And they tell people, we're going to control you because you're our new energy source. They tell people, we're going to put you in a perfect utopia called... The Matrix. Matrix 1.0. And human beings go up to it and they say, we don't like this. Now, if you don't believe that this is what happened, let me go ahead and play you a clip real quick. The first Matrix I designed was quite naturally perfect. It was a work of art, flawless, sublime, a triumph equaled only by its monumental failure. The inevitability of its doom is apparent to me now as a consequence of the imperfection inherent in every human being. Thus, I redesigned it. Okay. So, afterwards, the machines realize that there needs to be something. The world has to be imperfect for people to accept it. Causing a rounding error or a problem in the math and programming of the matrix. This is the one or Neo. So in order to fix this problem that they have so that the matrix can function, they come up with a system and that system is The Oracle. I have since come to understand that the answer eluded me because it required a lesser mind, or perhaps a mind less bound by the parameters of perfection. Thus the answer was stumbled upon by another, an intuitive program, initially created to investigate certain aspects of the human psyche. If I am the father of the Matrix, she would undoubtedly be its mother. The Oracle. The machine's new system of control for human beings is this. The one releases people from Zion and disappears and is their savior. The oracle tells the people of Zion that the one is going to come back and that they have to find him. So they go hunting for the one, for the machines. Find it. Use him to save Zion. And what saving Zion is, is going back to the machine home world source. So this machine uses human ingenuity to get them to take this rounding error, report it back to the machine's source in order for it to be resolved or deleted. Then... The function of the one is now to return to the source, allowing a temporary dissemination of the code you carry, reinserting the prime program. After which you will be required to select from the matrix 23 individuals, 16 females, 7 male, to rebuild Zion. Failure to comply with this process will result in a cataclysmic system crash, killing everyone connected to the matrix, which coupled with the extermination of Zion will ultimately result in the extinction of the entire human race. Then, once the source has obliterated the one, 
The machines then go and obliterate Zion. Then the machines release new people from Zion and they go and they're told by the Oracle that the one will be released. They find the one, it reports to the source. The source destroys the one, the source destroys Zion, releases a couple more people, tells them to find the one, so on and so on. Six times. Why do I say six times? This is the sixth version. Five. This will be the sixth time we have destroyed it. And we have become exceedingly efficient at it. They have continually changed the motivation of the one from just being an altruistic care for a bunch of people to being specifically about loving one person and wanting to save them. This is why in The Matrix Reloaded, when Neo is supposed to go back to the source, he doesn't. He goes back to save Trinity. It's, it's a three because Tr Neo is linked digitally and biologically to the machines in a way that I still don't 100% understand, but there is some imagery in the Matrix Res Resurrections that shows them rebuilding his body through machine. I, okay? This is the first one to break the cycle, and that's why we're watching that story unfold in that trilogy. See, Neo goes and he tries to save Trinity, and that's why their love story is fundamental to what happens, but that's also why those two characters are fundamentally connected. But there's another problem. There's another result of Neo being the one. He was aware that the one is just a machine thing, they say. That the Oracle was being disingenuous to Morpheus and playing her part in the system. That's the first movie. Know thyself. Are you the one? No. But if you choose to be, you fill out this robotic function. Choice. The problem is choice. The other thing that Neo does, Agent Smith. So Agent Smith, with his awesome Dragon Ball Z inspired sunglasses. Begins to copy and take over <laughs> the entire Matrix. So a new quid pro quo happens that has never happened in human history. Neo is free and can do things no one else can do in the Matrix because he has choice. He has not fulfilled his function as the one. He has an opportunity to, to genuinely save Zion, not as a part of their system, by saying, I will delete this virus that I've essentially accidentally created for you. I will delete it for you in exchange for a long-standing peace with humanity. Neo created Agent Smith by choosing to be the one. And by letting go of choice, he destroys Agent Smith. Here's the problem. That creates this, this sort of connection. Neo is not Neo without Trinity or Agent Smith. If Neo chooses to exist, Agent Smith exists and is caught in the balance between choice and not choice, which happens at the beginning of Resurrections, and Trinity exists. So apparently, this is the actual plot of the movie The Matrix. This character, the analyst, saw Neo when he was sacrificing himself and destroying Agent Smith. And it's his intrinsic motivation to bring him back because what he seems to see, the logic he seems to be following, is when he puts Neo being this overpowered element of the matrix interacting with trinity in a safe way they are they give off more energy for use for robots and then he finds out that that's kind of the way it works for humanity so one of the allegories in this movie is the way that we have longing for things and the way that we experience struggles and issues in the real world is sort of the matrix enacting a system where we we feel more distress and more longing these things that create more brain activity and create more energy for the machines it's a neat idea
And it's depicted visually neatly, the analyst is, in general. So, here's the thing. So this movie follows what I believe to be the original story of the Matrix. As complicated as it seems, I hope I was able to edit it down to seeming a little more streamlined, a little simpler. Um, and uh, my big problem with the, the sequels is here, where they're delivering a lot of exposition just by talking. And I think that's why they have Neil Patrick Harris because he's a lot more charismatic and it's a little like his character is designed a little differently from like the architect so that you have a little bit of charisma and a little bit of emotion in the explanation for why things are happening. And he's been observing humans. So it works intrinsically in the logic of the movie and it works as an idea outside of the movie. Here's the only thing that does not make sense to me. Neo gave them long-standing peace with the machines. Even people who are suspicious of that see it in the activity of the machines. So even if they found out that Neo was alive, they know that the reason that they have peace, especially since characters in The Matrix have played the movies The Matrix as games, they know that messing with Neo upsets that truce, that peace. So the second you wake him up, there was sort of this perfectly designed thing by the Wachowski sisters that if you leave Neo sleeping, then the story is over and that's how long that piece lasts. But if you create a sequel and you bring Neo back, that would inherently disrupt the piece that they have. It's kind of a really well designed written ending, uh, even if it wasn't delivered in the most like, you know, spectacular way. The machines have no reason to bring Neo back. But the hints are here that something is happening, just like in The Matrix when they reference Reloaded by showing you the screens before the screens are a thing in Reloaded. They are asking him to make a Matrix 4. This is the catalyst that causes everything to happen. The machines have also designed something to cause Jessica Henwick to recognize Morpheus and wake that program still a program into a functional morpheus why there is someone off screen who is the catalyst for causing this to happen it could be a negative entity who's above the analyst who's trying to disrupt a truce so that the machine war can continue with the humans and they can go back to their usual system of control but there's no real logic or reason to it and that's the idea is machines are cold and logical so they stop things current Zion is flourishing, there may be a bunch of stuff we don't know. I don't know. The machines make Neo make the Matrix 4. Why? The central idea of the original Matrix, like the core ending, underscored literally by Rage Against the Machine, wake up. There are systems in our lives that keep us in a grind and keep us from feeling like larger things are possible in this world or in our lives. And this movie tries to remind people that all we've really done is advance those systems into something different and we haven't changed. So back when I mentioned that Keanu Reeves commented uh, to Lana Wachowski that this movie has predict predicted... 20 years in the future again. It's interesting because he I, I hope he's right. Because the idea here is at the end, they could fly off and they could make the Matrix all rainbows. They could go make the Matrix 5. And a bunch of people would want the Matrix 5. But if you're paying attention, you should not want the Matrix 5. This movie is explicitly asking you what is the point in a Matrix 5 versus an entirely original, fantastical idea of a story told, whether in a movie or not, in some way that has merit and worth and, and freedom and value to people that can build something new. And whether people are going to profit off of that I don't know, but that's the question is there will be people who will not want this to change this system. 
And I, I don't think the people who wanted to change are better because it could be wrong. It could just be destroying one of the last things we have to hold on to in a crazy COVID world where everything feels unstable and we're losing all the staples we have. The climate's gradually getting worse. And eventually we're going to just be looking all back on all this kind of movie theater stuff as memories and we're going to miss it all and we'll all feel terrible and uh, dying inside. But I do think that the point is we are running out of of things to do. We are running out of franchises to explore. We got a sequel to Watchmen. We got... We got... Star Wars. Literally, when I'm recording this, the Boba Fett TV show is just coming out. This project is so long in the making that the original idea and creative team behind the creation of the character Boba Fett, not for the Christmas special, I'm not talking, you know what I mean, can't be involved, okay? The idea of what made that character cool and would what, make, what would make people want to see a movie about him can't be involved because it, it's been so long we've been continuing to do Star Wars, which is fine, but we could be telling original stories in the Star Wars universe. I mean, even with The Matrix, I've been thinking a lot about Lana and Lily Wachowski, who, you know, previously identified as Andy and Larry Wachowski. And yet you have this concept of a digital world where you can plug yourself in, have a residual self-image of whatever you want to be, and not... A single time did you have a male character have their residual self-image be female. Because that's who they believed they were on the inside. Like, never did they play with that idea. I mean, there were several things in this movie that are in the first Matrix movie. Like, depicting uh, the fast movement of the agents uh, differently. Um, the pill system. Uh, like, so many icons from the first movie that were absent from the sequels. But they're all just from the first movie. There's barely anything original, you know, like there's the, the shields, force fields, the movement of some things, but there's barely anything original at all in this movie that's all about the potential power of originality and potentially being free from all of these systems and the worth of that freedom. And I just don't understand, like, I, I maybe this is, that's the point, is they were in a machine, they were in a system, and they wanted them to create something. And they created what they were supposed to create. 